ko Waio, ko Te Atiawa, ko Taranaki Te Iwi, ko Joshua Hitchcock Aho. For the past 15 years, I've worked in and for Māori businesses around Aotearoa. As a commentator on Māori issues, I have a deep interest in how Māori businesses operate and how Māori contribute to and are impacted by the New Zealand economy. This documentary takes a look into the Māori economy to see how it works, what drives it, and what makes it, and the businesses who operate within it, different from the wider New Zealand economy. So I welcome you to this insight into a fascinating and growing part of the Aotearoa New Zealand economy. This documentary was wrapping up when COVID hit, fundamentally changing the documentary we had made. Businesses around Aotearoa were faced with unprecedented challenges as the country, and indeed the world, shut down. This presented a unique opportunity. An opportunity to revisit some of the businesses we profiled in the documentary to discuss how as businesses they were dealing with the impacts of COVID. Could Uara Māori hold strong against the global COVID crisis and navigate businesses safely through the devastating fallout? The situation here is moving at pace and so must we. I don't think that we've been through something like this before. There's definitely going to be a number of casualties. Now is the time to act. We knew that something big was, was brewing. Effective immediately, we will move to alert level three nationwide. It was so unprecedented and so widespread and so immediately impactful. What happens if our people lose their jobs? After 48 hours, we will move to level four. We got early warning about COVID. We own an educational tour company that brings in schools from all over the world. At the end of January, our schools from Asia put some yellow flags up and said, hey, we might not be able to come. And three days before they were supposed to arrive in New Zealand, our single biggest school that we service pulled pin on everything. I feel really sorry for some sectors and some businesses. I think it's, a, it's an incredibly tough time. As, as bosses and employers, we've never gone through anything like COVID before. The hardest part was not being able to call anyone and ask their advice because this situation was new for everyone. It's, it's not even like it was like the GFC, like it was just brand new for everyone and so no one had any answers. A lot of speculation and therefore a lot of confusion and a lot of stress. An average month for both of these businesses is about 320k. and. Uh, you know, that dropped to zero. Yeah, I think everyone knows that. Tourism's been hit pretty hard. You know, we've just had $17 billion wiped away from us. Immediately we identified roughly 100k worth of jobs that we we're gonna lose. Probably a reduction of about 20% or so, sort of year on year, you know, last year compared with um, a COVID year in that respect. Our seafood live coda to China, earning around $23 million a year, virtually stopped overnight. We weren't sure how long it would take for level four to stop. So that uncertainty put us in a position where we chose to hibernate our businesses. Our biggest concern was really about our people and our and wellbeing. We, we knew that if we felt the stress and we were concerned then, you know, so did our staff. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were doing everything that we could to protect them, to look after them. To say I had moments where I was stressed, sure, 100%, that absolutely happened. Uh, I had moments where I felt quite low because of the stresses our crew felt. We've got close to 500 employees across Wakatu Group. It's 500 families. We made sure that we had regular hui's online checking in with everyone's state of mind and their health and making sure that they're socialising, I suppose, because you're in lockdown, you're not, not too sure how that's going to affect some people's mental state. You know, there was a lot of concern around community support, mental health issues, you know, helping people through that uncertainty. There was quite a lot of um, anxiety, certainly within our whānau. 
So we were managing, we were managing that. Initially it was pretty scary, just the unknown, because there was a lot of talk going on in the media, a lot of hysteria around this is the end for hospitality, this is the end for tourism, everyone's going to lose their job. What's our worst case scenario? What projects were going to get delayed? Uh, what milestones might have financial impacts to us? What do all those look like? Tourism business, our revenues dropped to zero, uh, and our seafood business, that stopped. We were actually quite scared during that time, because there's so many unknowns. Yeah, we just basically weren't really sure what that would mean for our business and how that would impact our staff and ourselves. The worst case scenario was that we would uh, have to find employment for our whole team somewhere else and that would have to shut the businesses down. You know, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry, uh, you know, there's some, real, there's some real tough ones there. Businesses around us that are on the same road as us and quite large organisations are just yeah, downsizing significantly. Buildings are empty now around here. It was a really eerie feeling. Walking into a place that's normally filled with Lots of talk, music, it smells like bacon and eggs or fish and chips, there's people laughing. To go from that to like a ghost town, it did feel weird. So how could we make decisions uh, quickly, but also in the best interests of our stakeholders, our directors, our kaimahi, and of course our customers? Essential services needed to be determined. We had to work round the clock, first of all, to get registered as an essential business. So all, all of our people were focused on that. We got ourselves signed off as a, an essential service because we have a labour hire company, so we could start moving people to things like fruit packing, to security jobs for the supermarket, uh, tree planting, all that sort of jazz. So we, we, we made those moves really early so that we could really future-proof ourselves. Uh, we applied for the wage subsidy in, in the initial lockdown period to support our whānau who weren't um, able to work through that period. As soon as we found out that that was an option, we all just jumped on. I think the government did a very good job. The wage subsidy was the injection that a lot of New Zealand was looking for. Don't get me wrong, the, the wage subsidy was massive. But, but, but as you know, the wage subsidy could only go towards wages, and there were still other expenses, such as rent, insurance, power, and we had to find ways to cover those expenses. What if we fail? What if our markets start to collapse? What if, what if our um, lessees can't pay their rent? Uh, and regrettably, we made that difficult decision uh, to disestablish 309 of 348 roles. at the senior management level, we started doing some scenario planning around, well, what, what is this going to look like? And so there was rent relief given to those businesses that rent from us, um, where they needed it, and not everybody needed it. How we kept moving forward, so we started to really plan for, you know, what, what are a whole bunch of different scenarios that could happen from here. To, to maintain all our staff, we, we had to spend our own money. There's no way to do that on the subsidy alone. So we knew we could do that for so long, but it's not a long time that you can do that for before you have to really start making some pretty tough decisions. What was impressive in how Māori responded to COVID was in the speed in which we pivoted to supporting our people and keeping our businesses going. Some entities had to make the tough choices to close down, but many more were able to secure essential service status and find a pathway to growth. A large part of us was the switch to digital commerce. So we quickly developed a baseline COVID budget and then we, we did another budget which was really around oh, let's re-look at COVID and say what are the opportunities, particularly for us with being in robotics and agriculture, you know, given when you think about border constraints, labour constraints and being able to you know, provide some of those labour solutions. So that saw us employing people during COVID. So I think in the lockdown period, we actually brought on three or four new employees. We employed everyone fully through COVID. There was no reduction in their wages. It was actually full pay. We worked from home. We were well organised. And we've put in place a whole lot of new initiatives and ways of doing things that we've learned through that COVID period that have been really helpful. 
So what are the things we need to do to ensure that we can, we can keep our staff? What jobs are we going to lose? What jobs can we keep? And then just figuring out ways that we could prioritise and adapt uh, our staff's individual working set up at their homes. So as long as we had our computers and an internet connection, um, we were still able to do most of our business dealings, making phone calls and having Zoom hillies. During that time, we were actually employing staff, so we pulled in another three. Um, since then, has been a, another two, and we're looking at employing another two now. Um, so the business has actually grown. At level three, that meant that we were able to open for local deliveries and also for uh, contactless pickup. And so uh, we got creative, put out a video on Facebook to really encourage our community to order their deliveries through us, uh, rather than going through a third party like Uber, for example. And that, that kept our staff working through level three. I'm proud to say that we didn't let anyone go. In fact, we took on three extra staff. You know, COVID, level three, level two, forced us to do things better. And we're still doing today some of the things that we were forced to do during lockdown. Throughout the COVID crisis, Māori businesses maintained the values that built their businesses to sustain their businesses. When you have an underlying value like manaakitanga or kaitiakitanga, driving your decision making, it, makes, it actually makes the decision really easy. You know, you could almost call it social capitalism, for lack of a better term, because it does come in with a people first attitude. We always have. I think the principles and values will play a big role in who we are as a country moving forward. Those values that we hold really dearly as an organisation have really shone through and helped us to get through, get through this COVID thing. I'm not saying Māori business is perfect or Māori values are perfect, but there are some amazing value sets that we have that I'd love to see embedded in all businesses. Manaki tanga is number one. Your ability to look after people determines your mana. And I've always taught that in my, in my businesses. Uh, so no, the tikanga stuff's always been there, it's never going anywhere. But COVID has been a nice reminder that, hey, people, remember people, always first. COVID has reinforced that our values foster resilience. The ability for the businesses who practice these values to not only survive, but to thrive in the face of external challenges. And if even in the hard times, those values sustain and enable businesses to flourish, then there are lessons to be learned for not only New Zealand businesses, but businesses throughout the world.